Welcome to this uh, bookshop, Barney at the Battle. Alliteration is everything. Normally the battle isn't held in this kind of uh, formal scenario. It's much more relaxed, Parkinson-esque, anybody old enough to remember Parkinson, uh, style, uh, where we normally have armchairs and no desks, yes? So we have already built in this hostility towards you, the audience. But uh, feel free, it's meant to be a bit of fun, meant to be engaging, you're supposed to ask questions. Hands up, who's got the book, who's read the book? Read the book, we'll do that one first. Uh, who's got the book? Shameful, good. So the, per the point of this is... You're not allowed to leave without one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Douglas is going to convince you to buy it. That's the whole point of this exercise. Okay, so the, we're going to be discussing Rebel, How to Overthrow the Emerging Oligarchy by Douglas. My name is Austin Williams, by the way. Uh, I run the Future Cities Project. I'll introduce Douglas, for those of you who are not in the know. I think it's fair to say that you've been vilified a little bit in the press uh, over the years, not at least by a certain party member, but I think this, the book itself, uh, it's like a Socialist Workers' Party uh, motif. Um, it's a cracking book, actually. I mean, uh, not that I'm surprised by that. It's the fact that it's uh, genuinely revealing of certain traditions and trends in society. It's kind of uh, the dangers of capitalism, the dangers of anti-capitalists. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a clarion call in some ways for uh, a new liberalism and a new form of democracy. So uh, on the back cover, which I'll ask uh, Douglas about, it says we need a revolution, yes? Douglas himself uh, stood for election for the first time in 2002 in the Northeast's uh, Sedgefield constituency. Uh, he took a huge swing against Tony Blair, but sadly he missed. It says here. Sorry I came second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't kill my gag. And in 2005, he became a Conservative MP for Harwich in Essex, which is Samuel Pepys's old constituency. Pepys was imprisoned in the Tower of London on suspicion of treasonable correspondence with the French. Uh, so no chance of that, I suppose. After that, in 2014, Douglas was elected. He defected, uh, shall we say. He stood down and then got re-elected to UKIP to represent Clacton. And Matthew Paris uh, described Clacton as the dying part of England because he was referring to the elderly in, in the town. And it's not surprising that old people like Clacton because uh, even the seafront has persistent wind. Uh, and now, and I can now, laugh at that joke. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And now uh, he's defected, he, he defected to become an independent and then uh, stood down, finally quit Parliament altogether in 2017. And now, as a man of the people, Douglas lists one of his hobbies as making quince jelly. Uh, there you go. Uh, that's the working class revolution we're after. Um, so, but what you need to know about the book is, I mean, it's genuinely intriguing. Genuinely, I, I thoroughly recommend it, possibly more than most books that I, we've done in, in the Bookshop Barney series. So the way it's going to work is, is that Douglas is going to pretend to be surprised that I'm telling him he has to speak for five minutes um, uh, just about the ideas in the book to kind of convince you about what it's about, give you some uh, sense of it. Then I'll ask several questions, because I've gone through it in some detail, uh, to try and tease out some more, give Douglas more opportunities to speak on the subject, and then we can come out to you to ask questions that have arisen from what's been said. Yes? Okay. Douglas, that's your big build-up. Th thank Audio you very much, and thank you for, for, for coming. I wrote the book because I think something extraordinary is happening in politics throughout the Western world. I, I don't just mean um, in this country. Look at, look at the United States. For most of the past 50 years, political debate in the United States took part within defined boundaries, with, within clearly defined boundaries. Yes, there were Republicans and Democrats who disagreed on a, a whole bunch of issues, but there were some basic parameters at the center of their political system that they could all agree on. And yet, we now see incredibly successful politicians. The most successful politicians in America are those who define themselves almost in opposition to those middle-of-the-road orthodoxies. On the, on the left, Bernie Saunders, overtly socialist, um, very nearly became the Democrat candidate. And then, of course, um, Donald Trump, became the Republican candidate and uh, president of the United States. Um, and I think the, 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 the surprise at that result um, increases with every tweet. <laughs> Look at what's happening in Western Europe. Countries that for years have been bywords for political moderation and uh, pragmatism and consensus um, are, are, are no longer invulnerable to this upswing in the rise of alternatives. In Germany, the AFD, the alternative for Germany, now has about 80 seats in the German parliament. That would be a little bit like UKIP, my, my former party, instead of returning a, a single member of parliament at the last election, 
Um, returning 80. Actually, that's a pretty terrifying thought. So let's, you know, I would have had to be collegiate and get on with them, and, 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 and um, I couldn't be my own whip. Um, but on, on a serious note, there is this growing trend throughout the Western world for people to vote for alternatives. And I, I wrote the book because I, I wanted to explain what I think is going on. And it's very fashionable amongst many people who earn a living by writing about politics to blame the punter. Those journalists and commentators and BBC producers who only ever real meet real people when they pick up the dry cleaning <laughs> somehow seem to believe that it's the fault of the voters that they are voting for non-mainstream alternatives. And I, I, I want to just sort of test much of what they say. You, you don't have to look very far to hear someone on the Today programme or, or, or elsewhere explaining that it's all a protest against globalisation. Well, let, let's examine that. It, it's certainly the case that blue-collar workers in America and blue-collar workers in Western Europe are less well-off now than they might have otherwise been in terms of income because of globalisation. The addition of 900 million extra workers to the global labor market since China opened up and the communist uh, Eastern Europe, um, the, the, the Iron Curtain collapsed. Certainly, the addition of all those new workers to the global economy has um, increased, uh, the, uh, has reduced the cost of labor relative to that of, of capital. But the idea that somehow globalization has impoverished tens of millions of people is, is, is demonstrably false. It may have, as I said, led to the stagnation of wages, but it has cut the cost of living um, in almost every Western country pretty dramatically. To put it crudely, Joe Sixpack may not earn what he might otherwise have earned uh, because of the mass um, opening up of, of uh, China and India and elsewhere. But because of the opening up of China and India and elsewhere, he can buy a whole bunch of stuff for a fraction of what it would have cost him otherwise. The cost of consumer goods, of television, of, of textiles, of clothes, of, of so many things has fallen in real terms and fallen really dramatically in the past 20 years. So this idea that it's a protest against globalization, I, I don't think stands up to scrutiny. I argue in the book that actually the voters who are voting for these so-called populist alternatives are doing it because in a sense that they've clocked the extent to which their political systems, their democracies have, have been rigged. Of course, people in every Western state have the right to vote, and people in most Western states are able to go through the motions of democracy. But I argue in the book that actually, increasingly, those who make public policy in most Western states are less answerable to the public than they were a generation ago. Um, to put it crudely, every year the World Economic Forum hosts a, a, a meeting in Davos, the sort of people who go to Davos, let's call him Davos man, there are Davos women, but for the purposes of this, let's call him Davos man. Davos man goes to Davos and, and uh, has a week-long schmooze fest where he meets other people like him and applauds himself for being so well-connected and carries uh, away from meetings like that, global schmooze fest, a series of assumptions. And I would argue Davos man, who runs government, uh, big corporate institutions, big business, is utterly detached from actual real people. I think uh, David Goodhart has uh, 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 summed it up very, very nicely in many ways. The um, ordinary voters in Pennsylvania or in Clacton or in uh, parts of Germany increasingly feel that those who do politics for a living uh, take their views and treat them with contempt. And I, I, I think there's something in that. Um, I, I, I think there is a cliqueiness and a cartel in in, in our democratic system. And I, I, I don't just simply see the creation of cartels in terms of a democracy. I think increasingly the capitalist system itself has been dominated by a self-serving cartel. Many people make a lot about inequality as a driver of populism. Actually, if you look at data on income, the, 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 the facts simply don't sustain that. Income, income inequality in the United Kingdom, for example, is lower today than it was 30 years ago. I, I don't believe that there is a sufficiently strong correlation between income inequality and the rise of political populism to explain it. But there is a different kind of inequality, and it goes to the root of what I think is wrong with uh, our, our so-called capitalist system. It's the 
difference in the value of labor and the value of assets. For 30 years now, successive central banks have run monetary policy in a way that pushes up the value of assets. If you've got a house or a hedge fund, you've been quids in. And if you haven't, well, good luck trying to get on the housing ladder. One of the reasons I think we see a rise of political disaffection, particularly amongst younger voters, um, who in, in, in <laughs> are often very, very different from those who support parties like UKIP, is, is because of this sense of um, inequality between them as income earners and the value of assets they might one day aspire to have. In other words, if you're a 20-something-year-old in the southeast of this country, you can, um, you, know, you, you, you can have a job, you can have a pretty cheap mobile phone, you can have a pretty competitive contract on, on all sorts of things, but you, you try getting enough money together to buy a house. Good luck to you. Right. You're underselling this book. Uh, I was thinking you might want to just say a little bit about the new radical idea. I mean, mm -hmm. I know you've just mm -hmm. kind of touched on it, but that mm -hmm. phrase itself, because obviously mm -hmm. it sounds radical, mm -hmm. yes, and you're kind of implying that it's the opposite. So there's that interest, just for the people who haven't read the book yet, just to kind of explain how that works. I know you're getting there with what mm -hmm. you're saying. Mm -hmm. And the second one is just to just give us an idea about this kind of central section in the book as well, about the historical examples mm -hmm. about you know, how you see this happening before and what are the conditions for it to continue. Yeah. Sorry, um, I, I go on in the book to talk about what it takes for a society to, to prosper, what it takes for a society. We're, we're so used to human progress. We're so used to the idea that uh, we will have a higher standard of living than our forebearers. In the book, I go back and I, I, I remind the reader that actually it's an incredibly recent phenomenon, the idea of intensive economic growth, of per increases in per capita GDP. In order to have successful economic growth, intensive economic growth. I argue you need to have an open society that has a, a, a dispersal of power, the restraint on, on parasitic elites, um, independence, and um, openness to interdependence, um, trade, and the, the free movement of, of ideas. And historically, before, before the Industrial Revolution, there are very, very few examples of this. But I identify three societies, three republics, um, that may give you a clue, um, which managed to achieve intensive economic growth. The, the, the Roman Republic, there's, there's good data in the book to suggest that actually the Roman Republic managed to achieve a significant increase in per capita GDP. Um, similarly, the Venetian Republic, which had the um, uh, 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 same um, uh, uh, achievement in the Middle Ages, and um, the Dutch Republic. The Dutch Republic, uh, I would argue, is actually the home of the world's first industrial revolution rather than, rather than England. In all three cases, um, the uh, three societies managed to retain their independence. They, they either kicked out or freed themselves from external parasites. They managed to uh, disperse power, whether through democracy or oligarchy, uh, more often the latter, uh, which prevented any parasitic elite emerging. Um, and they were also remarkably open societies. Um, of course, vested parasitic interests, as I show in the book, in the late Roman Republic or, 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 or Venice in about 1300 or, or the Dutch Republic, soon put an end to that. I think in many Western societies, we're beginning to see the emergence of similar parasitic vested interests who are chipping away at many of the uh, uh, open assumptions that underpin um, prosperity and, uh, and progress. Good. That's more like it. There's a, I mean, it's a terrific section in the book, quite a long section, actually, uh, which does this kind of historical analogy, gives it a, com uh, a contemporary feel, and then moves on to kind of look more at how uh, some of these places failed as well as succeeded. So uh, even on that basis, I think it's worth looking at. But, but since you talk about oligarchy, I read in The Economist, there's about three new books on oligarchies at the moment. Um, so you've, you've kind of hit a moment. But when you talk about, uh, what do you say? You, you say there's an unaccountable establishment, a cabal, a clique, I don't know why the letter C figures, uh, a cartel, a coterie, um, but there's this oligarchy. I can think of other C words. Yeah, to describe sure, it. yeah, yeah. Uh, and you're kind of right, you're then critical of boardroom executives adept at helping themselves other people's yeah. wealth. You talk about crony capitalism, corporate fat cats. Right, I, think, I thought I was reading Owen Jones for a minute, and, and, and I'm interested because Owen Jones talks about shadowy organizations like this. Do you differentiate yourself from what Owen Jones is arguing in his book on the, on the establishment. I've got a great deal of sympathy. In fact, um, I was interviewed by Owen Jones, and um, I, I agree with a, a great deal of his analysis. I, I'm a free market capitalist, mm. but what we've got is, is not free market capitalism. Many FTSE 100 companies are run on a similar model to the way the East India Company was run. You've got a small group of managers who help themselves to the proceeds of the shareholders. Okay, admittedly, FTSE 100 companies probably treat their suppliers a little better than the East India Company treated its suppliers in India and Bengal, but 
the people who run many of these companies, they use the language of being entrepreneurs. The people who run FTSE 100 companies talk as though they are captains of free enterprises. They're not. They're people who have wormed their way up to the tops of big uh, bureaucratic organizations. They help themselves to an increasingly large share of the company revenues on the basis of very little accountability to the shareholders. Um, and and these, are, these are facts. There was a survey that I quote in the book where the top 350 UK public UK companies were, were looked at. Executive pay in those organizations had increased um, 80 or 90 percent over a decade, during which if you were an investor who had invested in those companies, you would have seen uh, uh, only a fraction uh, 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 return on your investment. Many, um, you know, what, what we regard as corporate governance, I think is a scam. And I, I, I think one of the reasons why we're seeing such a growth in private equity in this country is because if you invest your money in public companies, you are, you are putting your money in something that you, know, you will lose a considerable slice um, because of, because of the, the, the people who run those big corporate organizations. They're not, they're not free markets at all. Yeah, so do you make a distinction? Because, uh, again, you say the risk to the liberal order comes not from disillusionment of the demos, but it comes from new authoritarianism from on high. And I, and I know Owen Jones makes a similar point about the new authority. But, but there's a distinction between authority and authoritarianism. I mean, yeah. to me, there seems to be a, a collapse of authority in society, yeah. yes? But then you have this kind of, as we talk about, new radicals. I, and I, I don't think the new radicals, the so-called populists, I don't think they're the problem. They are a symptom of the problem. In fact, some of the um, populist new radicals are actually quite helpful to the oligarchy. Precisely, you know, give you the classic example of Greece. Um, if you um, are the Troika and you want to um, run the Greek state, um, having an illiterate government elected that, that, that doesn't understand basic maths actually makes you look like a safe bet. Middle class Greeks, I think, quite like the idea of the Troika running things because look at the alternative. If, um, if Nigel Farage is the alternative um, to remain, um, actually voting to remain in the European Union um, starts to look more attractive. Um, again and again and again, the new radical populists have actually played straight into the hands of the Davos clique. Um, they, they, they look like a safe bet if the alternative is, frankly, off the wall and kooky. Okay, right. So again, so you, uh, is it, that was me thinking about a conspiratorial element to your... To I'm not. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I mean, the, the the governing elite are too incompetent. The chances, you know, if you're a conspiracy theorist, you have to explain how it is that small elites, you know, these people can't even, you know, these 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 people can't sort of provide basic public services. The idea that they're capable of sophisticated conspiracies. It's a conspiracy of 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 of. Well, it's, it's not a conspiracy at all. They're they're, okay. they're not okay. up to it. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't mean they're not able to get you, as they say. But then there's a cynicism charge, which I'm going to throw at you to see whether you, it sticks. Um, so you say, uh, you talk about, <laughs> some very good quotes, you talk about the stinking hypocrisy at the heart of contemporary politics. And then you say, depressing, isn't it? Democracy has been subverted, capitalism has been corrupted, and the economy rigged. Um, and I just wonder whether, you know, because you, you talk about maybe some of these new radical commentators actually <coughs> helping prop up the new authoritarianism, do you feel maybe that even this kind of level of pretty harsh criticism could breed a cynicism about possibilities of change. They're like basically saying it's, it's, all, it's all going to hell in a handcart. Well, I'm, I'm actually an optimist. I think the world is getting better, um, despite rather than because of the political process. What I think we need to do is recognize that you know, there have been huge improvements and, and progress in so many areas of our lives. About the only thing that stayed the same is the way that we do politics. When you look at um, the way you do shopping, the way you go online and, and check your bank balance. Um, you know, the, 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 so many things that you do are so different to how you did them 20, 30, 40 years ago. And yet when it comes to politics, you're still expected every five years or so to make a choice between Tweedledee and Tweedledum. You probably live in a safe seat, so it probably doesn't make any difference whether you vote or not. And even if you do vote, um, the people that you elect probably don't actually make the decision because they farmed it off to some group of, um, some, sort of some sort of quango. Um, it, it doesn't need to be like that. Um, we can change the political system, but I think if we're going to change the political system, we need to recognise that you know, the, the parties are the cuckoo in the nest. They are, they are the people who've parasited and rigged the democratic process for their own advantage. Okay. How about this, then? You would, I mean, it's very interesting in the start of the book because it was kind of rumoured at the time, I remember reading about your involvement in UKIP, and then you come out and 
quite openly say it, that you admit to defecting to UKIP in order to, quote, take control of Euroscepticism. Yes, you felt Farage was leading us of a garden path. Off a cliff. Going to lose. Don't talk about cliff edges. And you, you wanted to refocus attention away from Farage. Um, so in some ways, you switched to UKIP not because you believed in UKIP, but because you didn't believe in UKIP in some ways. Yes. So again, that, how does that play in terms of the political... Um, scenario, the political cynical scenario? Well, my, my overarching aim in politics was to get Britain out of the European Union. It, for me, it was my number one. Um, it, it came before any allegiance to any, any party or anything else. Um, and I spent much of my adult life looking fairly obsessively at any clues of any opinion polls we could get our hands on as to what, what influences people's opinion on that issue. And we noticed fairly early on something called what we called the, the, the Farage paradox. The higher profile that um, certain types of Eurosceptic had, Eurosceptics had in, in the media and the press and the news, um, the less support um, there was for leaving the European Union. And um, I, I don't think this was uniquely my insight. I think other people saw this. I think David Cameron, for example, believed that the contest would be seen as a choice between him and business versus Farage and being rude um, towards Romanians. Um, and I, 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 I think um, there was an attempt by Cameron and others, um, and indeed um, a sort of symbiotic understanding between them and, and certain Eurosceptics, that they would create those battle lines. And if it had been a straightforward choice between um, UKIP, which <laughs> failed to win a single seat other than Clacton at the 2015 general election, and the you know Cameron and, and, and the political establishment, um, Remain would have won overwhelmingly and convincingly. Um, I did whatever I could to make sure, A, we got a referendum, put the pressure and, and the thumbscrews on Cameron by calling a, a, a by-election. But in the process, I was absolutely obsessed about this idea of making sure that the worst sort of Eurosceptics didn't bugger up the cause of Euroscepticism. And they nearly did. Okay, I'll just flog the dead horse one more time, uh, which is, I'm just, it's like tactical voting. Yes, it's all the rage now, isn't it? Yeah, that uh, get them out rather than vote somebody in. Mm -hmm. And that idea of not having necessary conviction in what you're voting for. So all I'm saying is, is we, kn we know what you did. We kind of appreciate the, the goals and the ambitions may have been noble or are noble. Uh, but the way of getting there, does that subvert that democratic process. Do you think the people watching you enter a party to fool us into thinking that was the I right party? I don't think I, don't, I no. fooled anyone at all. When I changed parties, I did something that no British politician, I think, has done in my adult lifetime. In fact, I think you need to go back to 1920 something to see someone who, when changing parties, triggered a by-election and held it at the following general election. When I, when I changed, when I left the Conservative Party, I didn't just move from one party to another. I announced that I was going to leave the Conservative Party. I made it clear that my constituents had elected me on the understanding that I was a Conservative Member of Parliament. I was leaving the Conservative Party and joining another. I thought I owed it to the people of Clacton to decide if they approved of that decision. I then resigned from Parliament. I took the train back up to Clacton, a bit of a lonely journey, um, and I offered myself for re-election to the voters in Clacton. And I had the full weight of the Conservative Party <laughs> machine against me. And I was re-elected by uh, voters in Clacton. Um, and I explained repeatedly, again and again and again, during the campaign, that you know, I, I was doing this because I believed we should have a referendum on Britain's membership of the European Union. And we should uh, make sure that we had a, a, a campaign that wasn't obsessed on the issue of immigration. Um, I didn't get any flack from people in Clacton when I made these points. I got a, a bit of flack from one or two kippers uh, behind the scenes. But um, I, I don't think anyone can accuse me of doing anything underhand or, 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 or um, you know, calculating. I was very, very open. Um, as I said, I, I think you've got to go back some time before you find another MP who was willing to open up the issue to their electorate and say, this is what I want to do. You re-elect me if you agree with me. Fine. Anybody feeling sympathy for Douglas at the moment? I'm only saying this because it's actually in the book, a short piece in the book. And I think it's very interesting how it opens up the conversation about democracy and mm -hmm. your, your distrust or your dislike or rejection of parties particularly mm -hmm. uh, and how we can reforge democracy. So um, that's the reason I'm asking you. Second, second thing, I suppose, is the, um, you know, you, like I say, on the back cover, it says, you know, now I, for, when I first stood for parliament, I believed all we needed was the right kinds of ministers. Now I believe we need a revolution. 
Um, and I'm interested, especially with your historical examples, as to what type of revolution you kind of favour. You kind of you're more of an American revolution than a French revolution kind of guy, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, Partly because, I, I presume, because the American Revolution got rid of the colonial power and freed it up for free trade, and the French Revolution got rid of its own elite well, and but, instituted yeah. a social revolution. But both of them got rid of parasites. The problem with the French Revolution is, you know, the, the, the American Revolution was really rather wonderful. Um, it got rid of the old order, and um, you look at the demands of the American revolutionaries. They wanted the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, that, that's not really a blueprint to re-engineer human society from scratch. Compare that with the French Revolution. They, the Jacobins have this idea that they can perfect not just uh, measurements, but days of the month. They, they actually create year zero. Um, and it didn't end entirely well. Um, I think we need far-reaching revolutionary change. And I think the way to do it is to, to, you know, to hold in check um, the parasitic elites, and there are ways of doing that. Um, getting rid of their grasp of monetary policy would be a, a good start. Fundamental reform of capitalism, um, so that people who actually own capital can control it and safeguard it from those who help themselves to it would be good. I would like um, some pretty revolutionary change so that individual citizens can opt out of a, a patronising and incompetent state. I think um, instead of, you know, we live in an age of self-selection where um, having choice over what you watch and where you listen and who you talk to and what you do with your time is becoming a cultural norm. Um, why is it that we have a national curriculum, therefore? Why is it that the state prescribes um, health care plans for families? Why not allow people to opt out of that and, and have their own health care plan for them and their families? Many of these um, ideas, I think, are quite revolutionary. You want a shift in the relationship between the governed and the governing. Um, many of the assumptions that we have about what the governed should do on our behalf, I, I think, are outdated and, and, and need to be subverted and overthrown. But in, but in that American Revolution example, are you saying you want to subvert the reality in order to free up the conditions for better free trade, effectively? Yeah. Um, there, are all sorts of, there are all sorts of things that government does. Um, it negotiates, for example, on our behalf, whether under the auspices of the EU or about to be the auspices of the United Kingdom government, free trade agreements. It basically, th these aren't free. Um, as they currently stand, free trade agreements prescribe what can and can't be bought under what circumstances. We need to move, for example, to a situation of mutual standard recognition. If it's legal to buy and sell a product in one country, it should be legal to buy and sell it in another, provided there are more or less the same expectations and, and standards. Um, there are a whole range of things where I... I I just don't accept that we need government to be the conductor any, any, anymore. Um, government is, I think, incredibly bad at managing the money. At the moment, most people in this country have to put their, 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 their wealth into, um, in monetary terms, into, into a, a, you know, the, 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 Steve, the, the Philip Hammond pound. And you know, it, it is debased and deported by politicians to suit their own objectives. Um, technology will soon give us the ability to have private currencies, uh, autonomous currencies. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's incredibly encouraging developments. Um, technology will allow us to create personalised curricula for our children, just as we have personalised playlists for what they watch on Netflix. Um, the idea that we all have to do things uniformly mm -hmm. um, is an assumption we, we're spoon-fed by the state. Many of those assumptions no longer apply. Okay, well, let me take those two. I mean, I'll finish with these two questions and, and then come out to the audience. On the agency thing, you say uh, we are we uh, we own our own agency. The engine of our own progress sits within ourselves. You say, which sounds a little bit zen, but I get I get the gist um, about reconstituting agency. Yeah, so that idea about maybe not having the state dictate, and we can then create a certain flexibility. But in a kind of an age of the social reality in which we find ourselves is one of maybe victimhood, of risk aversion, of identity politics, so all these kind of fragmentary moments, which again you talk about in the book. How do you do that? What's, you know, so it's like, it's like saying we should create agency in, a, in an era where agency has been in some ways re revoked. So how do you reconstitute A, a, a belief in the primacy of the individual, whether it's racism on one hand or um, identity politics on the other. These are forms of collectivism. These are attempts to assume certain things about people based on things that are frankly irrelevant to their character. Um, I, I feel very strongly that um, collectivism in, in, in all its forms um, is 
antithetical to the idea of radical individualism. It's not. It's not. It's not really Zen. I mean, that was a joke, by the way. Yeah. But uh, there was there was a a Roman poet called Lucretius who um, I I refer to quite a lot in 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 the book. And the reason why I think he's incredibly important and incredibly significant is because many of the things that we assume to be modern and contemporary thoughts that we have, um, an understanding that the natural world is a product of evolutionary design rather than uh, divine design, many ideas we have about the nature of the world as being self-emergent, of phenomenon in the world being self-emergent, of order itself being a self-emergent <laughs> phenomenon, it came as quite a shock to me to discover that these aren't modern ideas at all. These ideas were common currency in, in antiquity. And it seems to me that many of those insights um, about you know, um, having, having agency um, are, are what underpins Western rational thought. And they're not exclusively Western and they're not exclusively modern. Mm -hmm. um, they're absolutely vital for um, human progress. The assault on Western rationalism, I don't think, comes from a few angry lunatics on Twitter um, making unpleasant sounds about um, a sense of other. I, I think the real assault on Western rationalism and the Western enlightenment comes from elites who, like the Roman elite once did, find those Lucretian insights inconvenient and troublesome and are stamping out on them. Okay, think about it. Uh, so finally then, in terms of, because you talk then about this collectivism and the digital revolution, digital democracy, I think you call it. And it's partly through your experience of, you know, becoming empowered to uh, connect with people that you couldn't have connected with uh, through newspapers as an individual. But, but do you think that there's, I, I understand the, the, the role of reason and the role of uh, agency uh, to be reformulated to create this, this, this starting point for some kind of radical change. But then, surely, the digital democracy you're kind of talking about is about little laptop warriors in their own bedsits typing away, uh, making connections with people, rather than the, the collectivity, which I personally I think is required to make fundamental change. You do need weight of character rather than just you know many many individuals don't form a revolution. So again, how do you answer my? worry that what you're saying is that you want to have lots of active individuals, whereas I don't think that's actually ever going to create the change that even you reckon that you need. I, I think technology will bring about two very distinct changes to our democracy. The first change, and I think the least interesting, is it will change many of our assumptions that you need a party to aggregate money, communication, opinion and votes. Political parties exist to aggregate those things. Increasingly, we can see that you don't need to have a corporate party based in London, controlled by a small clique of people in order to do that. Um, I would say that one of the reasons why uh, Jeremy Corbyn has proved successful is precisely because he, he uses this momentum, it's not really a, 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 a controlled by the Labour Party at all, as a very effective way of... of, of you don't join them, though, eh? No, I, I haven't, but I, I, I did something rather similar in Clacton, actually. We didn't call it momentum, and it certainly didn't agree with the ideas of momentum, but as an exercise in using... Um, digital technology to mobilize opinion. We, 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 we did it and, it, and it worked incredibly efficiently and effectively. So I think we're going to start to see the what we assume political parties and only political parties can do increasingly being done by um, other non-party organizations. And I think that's exhilarating and exciting. But the real change that digital technology will bring to democracy is that actually Collectivism and, and things that we need to do collectively won't actually need a small elite clique directing them at all. Um, so we can, we can opt out of having the state do things for us at all. We can, we can control our own child's education budget. We can uh, control our own family's primary health account. Um, increasingly things that we looked to a small group of people to do and we kept them in check through the ballot box we're not even going to need a ballot box in order to be able to um, have those public services. Imagine a system where public services could actually be controlled by the individual members of the public who use them. If you do that, you do away with the need for a, a, a whole array of uh, the political process. And I, I, I think that's what's really very exciting and inevitable. Very good. I have a million more questions, but 
Any thoughts or comments on what's been said? Yeah. Uh, digital te- technology has allowed one thing, because I just bought a copy of Douglas's book on my Kindle while, while he was talking. And if, and if you get less money from doing that, I'll buy you a beer later on as well. <laughs> Thank um, you for buying it. I did use Philip Hammond pounds, though, not bitcoins, to buy it, so apologies for that bit. But the point, the point I wanted to make is that I did something uh, last year that I recommend more people do, which is I moved from London, where I'd lived for 30 years, back to where I grew up in Hampshire, and suddenly noticed that the world does indeed look very different from there. And given my background, I most definitely was part of the establishment in London, and now I'm not. And lots of things have surprised me. One thing, on a, on a very trivial level, uh, in, on one level, but obviously it's highly significant for the people involved, people are paid a lot worse in Hampshire than I ever imagined. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I offered to start paying people, because I run a business there, more than my recruitment advisors told me I should be paying, I was told I'd been Londonized and therefore didn't understand that people don't get paid as much in the, in the, in the regions. Um, the other thing I notice is, and this is a challenge, because I agree with Douglas on most things, but approach it from, well, come to left-wing conclusions rather than right-wing conclusions, and we can no discuss that at great length. No one's perfect. But, <laughs> but, but one of the things that depresses me is the disengagement of people generally from politics. So if you talk to people about politics, they, they say, I don't want to know. I don't understand politics. Um, and in the general election, I actually, did, I actually supported an independent candidate um, and had lots of conversations with people about trying to explain what that even meant. They didn't, couldn't understand it. And you're just saying about we'll have a world where people are more independent in the future. Um, and when you relate it to things that they understand, obviously they understand that politics is all about them. And, but, and one of the challenges for us, because the elite, the establishment, are quite happy with the position where most people think politics isn't for them and that they don't understand it, we've got to reinvent politics in a way that people realise it is absolutely about everything that, that matters to them and, and they very much need to be part of it. don't know an easy way of doing that, but that's part of the challenge. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Two, two questions. One is that uh, the political parties in UK and US are very robust compared to Europe. There's been a huge turmoil and change of parties in, in Europe. So how, can one, how, how do you envisage change coming back in the UK? because the established parties are very robust. And the second question is to do with the collective and particularly the vulnerable, and particularly the way in which small groups, uh, for example, in the US, which in some ways has a more libertarian spirit, uh, the oligarchic dominance of certain financial interests is even greater in the US. And how does one present that, prevent that kind of control? Because they can exercise control quite cleverly behind the scenes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry that I haven't read your book, and I hope that what I'm going to say doesn't, you, you haven't already answered it in the book. But I'm really excited by all your ideas, but I'd like to know um, what would be your first practical step? I mean, what practical steps would you make to begin this rev- re- uh, revolution, not just ideas? One of the things that concerns me about the, the kind of vision that you've uh, laid out there is um, how do you set about establishing the general, the general will so you know, along you know, Rousseauian lines, what's the mechanism for? Uh, yeah, what's the mechanism of political leadership effectively? Who kind of puts their head above the parapet and says this is what we should do as a as a nation? Uh, you know, how is that uh, how is that general will um, put forward and then established amongst the amongst the population? It's always a Rousseau question, isn't it? For, first of all, I I think the notion of a general will is a I- extremely dangerous one. And I think uh, Rousseau is one of the most dangerous and murderous thinkers of, of, of modern time. The ideas that Rousseau put forward of the general will ended with a committee of public safety uh, engaging in, in, in mass murder and the Napoleonic Wars, which we may have a romantic idea about, but were incredibly destructive, a uh, 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 bloody I- I- event. Um, Rousseau's basic idea of the, the, the general will I, I profoundly dis- disagree with. It is necessary for some states um, to make decisions, to take action um, uh, for the whole. Um, it's necessary for a free republic, and when I say republic, I, 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 I don't necessarily mean it's possible to be, a, 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 if you like, a republic with a monarchy, a, a, a self-governing states um, that are free from, free from outside influences. It's necessary for them sometimes to take collective decisions. Um, but the idea that you need a constant group of people 
um, determining the general will, I think, is an extremely dangerous and destructive one for, for all free republics. Um, and I think history shows that. You need a political system that actually holds in check the grand ideas of, of the governing elite. Um, successful countries, successful republics, whether the Roman one, which had you know two consuls uh, uh, serving for a, a term limit of a year each, um, and a series of elected magistrates with power dispersed, or whether it's the Venetian Republic or the Dutch Republic um, or, or the US Republic, um, were successful precisely because they created all these constraints upon people who might otherwise presume they could divine the general will. Um, it's good to have a, a, a weakened um, a political leadership that can't impose its idea of the general will. Um, I, I then deal with the question of... Um, of, of, of London and it's quite staggering isn't it when I was a member of parliament for Clacton I would leave one country London and I would get off the train an hour and ten minutes later in, in another one and many of the assumptions about the price of a cup of coffee or how much you could be paid for an hour's work it was a different universe, a different world and I, I, I used to think that it was quite normal and natural and an expression of the free market that London is this global financial centre, and to some extent it is. But I, I, I don't think that we can escape the fact that a lot of what we think of as the financial service sector in London is actually subsidised. We've run since the early 1970s the monetary system in a way that uh, favours big banks. There's a reason why <laughs> since the early 70s uh, the financial sector in this country has ballooned um, and in Germany, they have a significantly higher um, a, a, a amount of manufacturing. If you run the money in a way that suits uh, big corporate banks, you tend to get big bloated corporate banks. And much of the economic activity that takes place in London is trickle-down economics from the consequences of all those subsidized banks. Quantitative easing. Um, all of these are subsidies to the financial sector. Um, I, I, I don't think it's an expression of the free market at all. Um, the good news, though, I, I, I think, is that um, many of the um, things that successive governments in this country have done to subsidise the banking sector are, are, are no longer sustainable. In fact, the banking sector, thanks to financial technology, is, is going to be disruptive, uh, disrupted, and it, it's going to be quite, quite wonderful to watch. When people realise that you can actually do banking without big bonuses and big bank buildings attached, um, um, you're going to um, see a lot of people realise that actually um, those big subsidised uh, pay packets are not worth it. Um, there's a question about the US party system. And the United States has a two-party system. Um, and, you know, it, but it's, it's a very open, fluid two-party system. It's possible to be a sort of um, a, 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 a Democrat in the United States who supports gun ownership if you are trying to stand for office in Texas, but to be a sort of tree-hugging Republican if you're standing for office in, in Vermont. Um, they have, generally speaking, quite broad bases. One of the reasons for this is because they have open primary candidate selection. Um, instead of a small group of people in Washington deciding who gets to be on the ticket, um, it's often left to ordinary voters, registered Republicans or registered Democrats or sometimes non-registered voters at all to decide. And I think that explains the fluidity of the American system. It, it, incidentally, the, 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 the open primary system does sometimes mean you get some rather extraordinary insurgents being put on the ticket, like Donald Trump. But um, generally speaking, the US party system is more open to um, those outside of the um, political clique in Washington because of open primaries. Now, how do we break the political cartel in, in, in this country? Well, you know, I, I tried. I, I, spent, you know, I stood for Parliament um, trying to do so. Um, and in my little corner of Essex, I, I think we managed it. But unfortunately, um, where Clacton led, the rest of the country didn't quite follow. Um, and you know, it's incredibly difficult to break the party system fundamentally because you have an electoral system that makes it incredibly, incredibly hard. But I, I think it can be done. And I think uh, increasingly, um, as non-party players start to understand some of the tools of the trade, you will start to see more independence. I hold that great hope that we might see more independents standing to be police and crime commissioners. 
I would love to see serious independent challenges for some of the mayoral offices. Um, I, I think it, it, it will um, become increasingly possible, perhaps, in, in some of those fiefdom seats, Labour fiefdoms in, in the northeast of England, uh, Tory fiefdoms in the southeast of the country, to see um, independent candidates come along and successfully challenge. Um, it's, it's possible. I, I, I think I managed to do it where, in, in Clacton, where I, I, I stopped putting the name of my party on any, any literature that I put out in, in 2007, 2008. And I, I, I think I managed to, uh, to, to win elections, in effect, running as an independent. Um, finally, what practical things should we do to, to change? I, I think the number one most important political reform we need is the right of recall. Um, if you allow ordinary voters to trigger by-elections if they think that their local representative is uh, lazy or fiddling their expenses or... Um, making offensive comments about women or whatever it is, if you allow local people to trigger by-elections with the right of recall, you would dramatically change the relationship between the political uh, 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 professionals and, and the voters. In um, seven out of ten seats in this country, um, haven't, you know, uh, stand zero chance of changing hands in a general election. Um, in most general elections, in, in, in I think four of the past five general elections, fewer than one in ten seats change hands, with the exception of Scotland. Even in the great Labour landslide of 1997, only three out of ten seats change hands between parties. Uh, this means that most politicians know that they can effectively ignore the views of local people, and so long as they keep in with the party whips, the, the cartel perpetuates itself. If you had a right of recall, if ordinary people could trigger recall votes, it would change that. Interestingly, we pushed and pushed and pushed. Zach Goldsmith led the charge on this for a recall mechanism. Nick Clegg, as Deputy Prime Minister, introduced a so-called recall proposal. But unlike real recall, number one, under the Clegg proposal for recall, there was no actual recall vote. And secondly, it was a committee of grandees in Westminster who would decide whether or not an MP should face a by-election. I think it's rather wonderful that Nick Clegg, of all people, didn't introduce real recall, given what's happened to the MP in Sheffield Hallam. Um, if Nick Clegg had given us real recall, he might well be uh, on the way to being returned to Parliament as the MP for Sheffield Hallam in a by-election. The thing that I was most struck by was the historical part, um, the way you demonstrated the republics that you talk about. I think there might have been one or two other references. It was compelling. As a non-historian, I thought that was incredibly interesting. You mentioned the shock that you had from understanding Lucretius. I wonder if you had a shock from discovering that, or did you know about it already and then want to write about it subsequently? But I think it would be good to explore a little bit more and explain in the modern terms just how powerful that story of success was for those individual republics, and also the failures before or the subsequent failures when they went wrong, which are equally compelling arguments, by the way, in the book. And if I just may add one other thing, which is just on the way you've got to and the success you had as a quasi-independent MP is also a compelling story. And I don't believe that's been ever really told in the way that it should have been. Because what you think you achieved was very, very difficult, especially winning the second, the general election when you're up against the that whole backdrop. And I just wondered whether you were interested in, um, if you like, taking the blueprint. Okay, you've told the individual story in the book and, and today, but you actually have got a blueprint for that success. So if you were interested in changing, in the way that you say, the revolution, are you inclined to roll out that, um, that blueprint and show people how they can do it? Because you don't have to do it yourself, because it's down to the individuals to do it in the, each, each constituency. Are you keen to do that? Mm, great, thank you. Yeah, I, I want to take up uh, your discussion about the Dutch Republic and this question about digital democracy and what the way that you're coming across is an assertion of the individual. But the attack on oligarchies uh, by oligarchies on uh, 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 Western democracy has taken the form both uh, uh, an attack both on the private sphere but also on the public sphere. And it's inadequate to uh, uh, challenge the oligarchies if, 
uh, uh, we only assert the individual and reclaim the private sphere, that's important. But we also need to reclaim the public sphere and the commitments of political community and the commitments of cultivating and maintaining and conserving the fabric of society. Because the thing that's really striking about the rise of the Dutch republics is a very practical public uh, uh, responsibility called the law of the spades. The Netherlands, the low countries, would not exist without public commitment to hold back the sea. You know, the whole idea of the very existence of the Netherlands was dependent on, you, we might not call it collective action, in the, in the, or we, but with, um, uh, because of certain connotations of social engineering, but it's got real public uh, 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 cooperative um, aspect, and I think there's a danger in just simply asserting the sort of the laptop digitalism that that uh, we just have a very individualised form, mm -hmm. which is entirely compatible with the oligarchy. The question I, I mean, I have a lot of sympathy with a lot of the symptoms that you've identified and the idea that we need to take action. I um, wouldn't quite characterize, characterize myself as being revolutionary on that issue, though I do think there does need to be a change in ideas as to how we go about these sorts of things. And that's, it's at that level that I really want to probe what I see as the key idea underlying your analysis, which is a particular idea or model of what it means to be a person. You seem to, con you, as you said, you conceive of it as a kind of radical individualism. And of course, individualism can take a variety of forms, but yours takes primarily the form of a, a conceiving of uh, human life and our uh, relationships with others on the lines of uh, voluntary decisions, on choice, opting out. You seem to, the primary model seems to be an economic model. And what my concern is that if you, if your concern is with a kind of hierarchical, oppressive form of power in our social relations, when you start to conceive of individuals in this primarily atomized economic sense, whether that will give rise to relationships that are in, the, are in themselves more instrumental and as a consequence we start to conceive of each other as obstacles or as objects to be confronted rather than subjects to be engaged, and whether over time that will in turn lead to uh, the same poison that you're trying to cure, albeit, th albeit th in a different way, the same kind of authoritarian uh, uh, power relationships. I, I'd be really excited about this sort of devolution of power to individuals to make choices. So in the, in the market, we make choices about a whole bunch of things. And we should also have the right to do the same in education, in health, and all of these, uh, all of these areas. So we may collectively decide that everybody has the right to free education and the right to free health, but they're given the economic power to then make decisions and suppliers can, can compete. I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more on that. Just a very, very small example. When my, my son, who's, um, who's autistic, uh, when he was going to college, the Michael Gove reforms came in just before he went, and he would have just gone to the local authority sixth form and had an appalling experience and probably ended up in drinking cider in the park. We, we had the opportunity to take him to a local um, working farm uh, sort of Christian community that set themselves up as a college. So we had free education for him, but we had the freedom to choose new suppliers, and there's a free market in suppliers. And I, and, and I think that ex radically extending that idea is, is very attractive. But a second question is how then, when you're making a collective decision as a society as to what that policy should be, how do we make that decision without political parties? Because we need to discuss what they should be. We need to establish what our principles are. And we need a public contested area where we work those arguments out. We fine tune them, we change our ideas, and we have to win over the majority of people for a mandate for that to be the policy that the society then works by. So, sorry, two questions in there. Yeah. 
Not an original point at all, but I just wanted to hear a little bit um, about your response to the sort of, I guess, the classic more left-wing response to your position, which is that, yeah, great, let's break up all the oligarchies. But to do that, to take two examples, we'd need to break up all of the huge corporations that exist as monopolies, like, and, and some of the more interesting political thinking coming out of the left in the States is talking about like going back to some of the roots of left-wing activism where you think about breaking up monopolies. And to take another example, to break the control of, like, Big business, big business managers, or even shareholders would be to you have to massively redistribute wealth. So I, I wonder how like you maintain your sort of free market leanings in the face of the sort of obvious oligarchical implications of concentrations of money. So as a general theme yep. building up here, so you don't have to answer them specifically. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to go into Dutch. History, no, I'll, yeah. I'll do it. I, I'll, I'll counter through quickly. I do believe in far-reaching radical reform of. of capitalism, um, and I outline detailed proposals to reform corporate law, um, and I also believe that we need to re rein in the worst successes of, of fractional reserve banking. I don't think the current public business model that we've got and fractional reserve banking are, are compatible with free market capitalism for much longer, and um, unless we want to see a hard left socialist government as a consequence of the failures of the system, um, I think we need some pretty far-reaching um, um, radical change. But the reason why I, I'm sceptical about the left when they talk about breaking up cartels is because like the Jacobins, they want to break up the oligarchy and replace it with their idea of a blueprint and set themselves up as the new oligarchy. Um, that's never entirely a successful way of doing things. Um, jumping quickly, if I may, and yeah, I, I am going to talk about the Dutch. The reason why the Dutch Republic was the first modern economy is because they booted out the parasites, the Habsburgs, they sent them packing. They dispersed power. Now, you talk about the water boards, the drainage boards, as a collective endeavour. The fact that money had to be spent and decisions about how that money was spent on something as vital as keeping the sea at bay meant that there was this long tradition within the Dutch Republic of dispersed decision-making. People made decisions about water boards and drainage boards at a local level, dating back into the late Middle Ages. So there was a tradition of dispersed power, and I would say that was reflected even before the Treaty of Utrecht and, and the, 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 the creation of the seven provinces. And of course, the Dutch Republic was open. It may annoy uh, various um, people in my former party, but the reason why the Dutch Republic was so successful is because one in 10 of the people there was an immigrant. People took capital and ideas and innovation there, and that really kicked off the first industrial revolution. So it had all those ingredients. Um, I, I think the enemy to to radical individualism is always an elite that comes along in different guises with a different excuse every time and insists that human, social, and economic affairs must be organized by grand design. They've done this throughout history. They've created an ethical framework in the patrician societies of Egypt or, 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 or the Euphrates or the Yangtze. There was always a different set of ethics and a different creed that insisted upon organizing human affairs by design, but it always did so in a way that suited the parasitic elite at the top. And again and again and again, what politicians talk about um, as a, a, an ethical reason for their intervention in society is a pretext for their parasitism. They're not genuinely interested in tackling many of the things that they say. That, you know, how many politicians have said, you know what, I used to argue for a massive welfare state, but you know, a massive welfare state hasn't actually reduced welfare dependence. Therefore, you know, let's try a different way. They always find ethical excuses for their intervention in order to engineer uh, a society according to their, 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 their designs. That is the root cause of the problem. Um, one of the answers to this is, as, 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 as came up, um, you know, the, 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 the right, you know, the right to decide how your child is educated, but with public money, is extraordinary. I don't know why. I don't know why every party doesn't make this their core policy. It's such an enlightened and liberating idea. You collectively decide how much money is available to every parent, but you allow parents and schools to decide how that's spent. Okay, of course, if you create such a system, you're going to have to have some state intervention. You couldn't have, you know, some you know, uber creationist school teaching, you know, voodoo science. You couldn't have a, a state subsidized madrasa. You're going to have to have some state intervention. But you don't need a group of politicians constantly intervening in the education system. You just need a state that sets the basic parameters. Any school that conforms to the basic idea of what a liberal education should be um, with a, a huge variety of, of, of autonomy and uh, diversity. 
Um, and I, I, I really don't see why it's... it's you know, ask yourselves why politicians aren't in favour of this. Politicians aren't in favour of this because they understand that it doesn't make them central to the problem. And politicians... Uh, politics is about one long search for a small group of people to put themselves at the centre of everything and make it all about them. Uh, these ideas are about actually getting them out the way. Douglas, you said earlier that we still ha have a two-party system in this country. Well, I would perhaps say not quite. The, the Labour Party is no longer the Labour Party we, we knew and some of us loved. It's been taken over by a kind of cult, but which is not really committed to par parliamentary democracy at all. I mean, the, parliamentary, the Labour Party was founded as a parliamentary party. This is a, a populist, uh, street-based party. Momentum is the politics of the street, is the politics of the placard. Um, when we had the referendum, it was quite... It wasn't really just about Brexit, in my view. It showed that there was a division in the country that is not reflected in the, uh, the um, geography, if you like, of politics in Parliament. We're facing a situation now where the EU is destabilising. We don't know how long it's going to survive. Never mind Brexit. It may be taken over by events. Um, and although I have a good deal of sympathy with your ideas, I'm just looking from a practical point of view. If we are faced with a, a political vacuum, what is going to fill it? Because nobody seems to have the answer, and I haven't had the answer, and usually it's something not very nice. But um, I think that's the challenge that we have, uh, and I'm certainly grateful for your comments today, which is at least a start, perhaps, in the right direction. So you have your Burkean critique of the French Revolution. I want to see how far you agree with, with Burke. And I'm thinking of the speech to the electors of Bristol, where he talks about how representative government requires this notion of trusteeship, uh, the idea sometimes that the representative has to make decisions that it might be against what the immediate desires of the constituents are. Was Burke right there? Was he wrong there? How do you think about that problem? <coughs> we question about the general will. So when you campaigned, uh, and I supported, yeah, and I voted Braggs and all that there, that's an expression of the general will. Britain uh, equals self-determination. So I just want to push you a little bit on this idea of the primacy of the individual. Because if you believe in the primacy of the individual, the extension of that surely is self-determination and the general will. So what I want to unpick, if you have time to come back to me, is is there a pessimism about the human condition from yourself when it comes to us collectively organising together? I mean, this might sound banal, but the fact that we have public parks, that's an expression of the general will. Or do, do you want to live in a society which is totally underpinned by nothing but contractual relationships? Because there is a thing called human solidarity and social solidarity, which is absolutely not antithetical to the idea of freedom. So be interested in your thoughts. When I use the phrase general will, I'm talking about something very specific. It's an idea that Rousseau talked about. Please don't make the mistake of thinking that I, if I'm saying general will is a problem, I'm not saying we shouldn't take some decisions collectively. There are some things where you need to take an aggregate view. Just a state making decisions about rates of taxation, trade policy, a town deciding which field to set aside for a public park. You, you, you have that need. But the general will, as defined by Rousseau, is something very specific. It's a presumption that society needs a group of people who can divine what is in the higher interests of everyone. Um, it, 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 it's at the root of Jacobinism. Um, I would also say it's probably at the root of Bolshevism. It, it didn't end well. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't need in a society to have some collective decision-making, but the general will is something very different to that. Um, Two and a half party system. Yeah, we do have a two party system. And I think all political parties rely on um, a, a basic fallacy. And I, in my book, I refer to it as the, the big man fallacy. It usually is a big man, not always, but it usually is a big man. And this idea in politics that you elevate a particular leader, you create the cult of an, a, an idea in a party that, that that one leader is somehow the answer to everything. We saw this with Tony Blair in 1997. Um, the, the, the idea that somehow Tony Blair would be elected and the world would automatically become a better place. He was also almost sort of messianic. We saw this with um, Barack Obama. He was the one. Um, his hopey-feely ideas ended up with 
Donald Trump, who certainly wasn't the one. Um, David Cameron, um, who was supposed to be this great transformative figure. Well, now we see the idea that, you know, perhaps Jeremy Corbyn is the one, or heaven forbid, Jacob Rees-Mogg. When are we going to get it into our heads that actually, if you keep on doing politics like that, you're going to end up disappointed? Why? Because no one individual, no man or woman, has the power to change things and make them perfect. And, and this is the root problem of the big man fallacy. It encourages us to think that by voting for a political party, we will perfect the world. Actually, the best you can hope for in a system of democracy is to elect people who will restrain the ambitions of the powerful and keep the parasites off your back. Um, the world is getting better despite not because of these people. These people are not the engine of progress. They are, um, uh, 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 more often than not, actually the cause of regress. Um, now, there was something I was very, very keen to say, and it would have consulted brilliantly into the chap at the back, but you said I wasn't allowed to say it. Cool. Would you just quickly remind me on, on the, the, the point you made? On Burke. 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 Yeah. yeah. You said Burke and his address to the people of Bristol, where he famously explained to the good people of Bristol why he wouldn't do what they wanted, because he was a representative and not a delegate. Perhaps people who quote that Burke speech should be reminded that the good people of Bristol kicked him out of office four years later. People are perfectly welcome to say as politicians that they can ignore the views of the voters. There are occasions when I did as the MP for Clacton. Um, but the fact is that you know, when Edmund Burke made his speech that only wise people assembled by the banks of the River Thames in a palace could make a decision, they didn't have the radio. Of course the people in Bristol couldn't understand what was being said. They were 200 miles away. They didn't have television. They didn't have instant reports of what was being said. The public, by definition, had to be separated from the conversation about public policy taking place in a palace by the Thames. I think we can do things a little differently now, though. Um, I'm with Burke very much on, on the French Revolution, but I, I do think that this idea that we should defer to these um, representatives who somehow have a higher wisdom, put to rest any of those assumptions by listening to 10-minute debate in the House of Commons. It's, you know, it's, it's, a lot of it is pretty dire, a lot of it is pretty cliched, and a lot of it is by people who haven't had an original thought in many, many years. Um, there are many good people in the House of Commons, but the idea that we can leave it to them to make these decisions without us taking careful note of what they're saying, I, I'm afraid, is, 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 is not a view I have sympathy with. Can we thank Douglas, please? So that's, that's the book, ladies and gentlemen, Rebel, How to Overthrow an Emerging Oligarchy. Uh, advocates itself as a, a revolutionary text. Personally, I would say it's radical. I would say it's actually trying to create the conditions not to have a re revolution as it happens, but so be it. Uh, it's a very good intervention in, a, in an intellectual exercise. It's reintroducing reason and activism and uh, the sense of agency of the individual and, and, the, and the subject fundamentally important book. Go and get a copy now. Mm -hmm.